turn to the book of Acts, chapter 16, put a piece of paper in there, as we will be looking at that in just a short time. What is the pastor's main and most important job? I'll be asking that question a little bit later this morning, and uh, you can think about it until then. I've had quite a few Timothys in my life, but for the longest time I had Pastor Randy as a Timothy for 28 years. And uh, we started out back in 1989. Seems like uh, ancient history. And uh, started to study the Word of God together and uh, had uh, rich times in, in God's Word as we worked through it. Uh, became associate pastor and pastor here with the uh, desire and vision to see him take the helm uh, when God calls me home. Uh, but uh, now God has gifted me with uh, Pastor Alex, a uh, very gifted young man, and uh, trust that God will use these <coughs> next five and a half months that are ready before him to help train him uh, as a young man to prepare for the rest of his life in ministry, whether it be as a pastor or a missionary or wherever God calls him to uh, in the coming years of his life. And it's going to be exciting uh, for me to watch him uh, grow. It's going to be grueling for him because I won't give him all the answers and uh, force him to think and work through it all. But uh, I just uh, want to give you some list of uh, jobs that a pastor may get encountered with. So uh, I'd like you to write all of these down, Alex, so make sure you have them memorized by the next time we meet tomorrow. Um, and uh, you can see the list is uh, you know, rather encompassing, although there's a second page to this. Uh, <laughs> Discipleship and mentoring, uh, GGF ministry, committee team meetings, and yard work, putting up scaffolding, uh, listening to stories of people that call me on the telephone, uh, setting up chairs, writing articles for Truth Magazine. But then I got another list of uh, setting up more chairs, rototilling the flower bed outside, digging holes for plants, blowing and raking grease, and painting and uh, all kinds of meetings, board meetings, and uh, you know, uh, they're, they're not boring, but they're good board meetings, and then secretary's minutes, and then I got another list, uh, fixing lawn tractors and blow snow blowers, blowing snow in the winter time, shoveling the snow, and the list just goes on and on and on, and rewriting the work, constitution and bylaws that uh, we did, as well as the uh, documents related to the doctrinal statement that we already passed, uh, last year answering financial questions for the accountant. And then I have another list and it says giving directions to the office manager and the accountant, the mentoring and discipleship of uh, pastor and interns like uh, Pastor Alex, uh, following up on church business, uh, just as I did with Pete this morning, trying to get these lines all set. We're meeting with the electrician this week and uh, hopefully be able to get them to do their job so that we can get on with the other things. Yeah, it just makes me tired just thinking about it all. <coughs> but uh, you got that list down now? Uh, he's got it in his computer because I sent it to him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but I just want you to understand that there are different kinds of pastors. Uh, some are shepherds. And uh, I, that's what I would like to call myself is I'm a shepherd pastor. I, I love to uh, watch and care and, and minister to people. And it is really my privilege to be here for nearly the 30 years that God has called us to this ministry. And it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, there have been some trying times over the years past, especially in the early years uh, when we came here and struggled with a, a number of issues that we had to work through. And, and uh, we had a number of people uh, leave the church at different times for different reasons. And uh, it's been 
hard and it was uh, difficult to watch them go. And uh, as a result of it, we were uh, faced with uh, new challenges. Uh, there were three questions that uh, I asked Pastor Alex when he came here. In fact, when we sat down for the very first day, the first question was, what is the most important attitude of a pastor of a local church? And I forced him to, to work through and to think through what is the most important attitude of a pastor in the local church? My response to him is humility. I think that one of the things that we as pastors, sometimes we get cocky, arrogant, proud, self-centered. I have to constantly remind myself, I am here because God put me here. I'm here to serve the people. I'm here to live and to glorify my Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not here to make a spectacle of, of myself. I'm not a comedian. I'm not a, an entertainer. I don't try to tickle your ears and teach you things that uh, make you feel good. I hope that you're encouraged at times at the promises of God and what he has given. I've got a second question that I asked Pastor Alex. What is the most important function of a pastor in a local church? I know if I asked you that question, you may say preaching or teaching. The most important function of a pastor in a local church. My response to Pastor Alex was and is, love the people. My most important function as a shepherd is to love the sheep, to care for the sheep, to spend time with the sheep, to minister to the sheep, to listen to the sheep. I got a third question. What will be the hardest time in loving the people in and outside the church? I love you. What's the most difficult thing that I have to face in this ministry or any ministry for that matter of any pastor in any church? What's the biggest hurdle? In loving you. Not having enough time. I would love to spend time with you and go to your house or have you come to my house and sit down and just spend an hour or two talking. I minister to about 200 plus people in this ministry. We don't have a 200 people here this morning. You people sometimes stay home, go do other things, go on vacations and everything else. There are 200 people that are part of this assembly in one way or another. Some people are outside the church and I'm working <coughs> with those people and I'm trying to bring them to Christ and to try to help them to understand how to be saved or, or how to walk the Christian life. Uh, the ministry is the most wonderful thing in the world. You need to love to be stressed out. The last two days, uh, because of Ollie and Lori being here, I took off. And it was strange to take time off from work and just do my own thing and relax <coughs> and pull back. Did you see that list that I had? That's a real list. 
And uh, it's a lot of stuff that goes on in my life and my wife's life. And uh, we try our very best to do all of that ministry in regards to it. I want you to go to First Corinth, uh, First Acts chapter 16 that I asked you to turn to uh, and sort of slot in a, a, a picture here. Because I want you to understand that Paul is writing to a young man by the name of Timothy. And I want you to see where he meets him. And just a little bit of information concerning that. Verse 1 of chapter 16 of Acts. Paul came to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there was named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, and his father was a Greek. Timothy was well spoken of by the, the brothers at Lystra in Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and he circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, and they all knew that his father was a Greek. This is the meeting of Timothy and Paul together. And as we find here that uh, this young man, Timothy, became Paul's co-laborer in Jesus Christ, and he took him and he went with Paul and ministered with Paul, in the bu book of Philippians in chapter 2, it tells us that the young man, Timothy, was a protege of the Apostle Paul, that he was, had a kindred spirit, as some of the translators say, and that he was just like Paul. And uh, as a result of it, uh, we find that this is the place that he is going to be uh, ministering. Timothy's ministry is in Ephesus. And we find here that this is just a, a picture of some of the artifacts and, and the things that uh, Ephesus had a little look. I, I could give you a, a number of other pictures, but I'm going to pass on it just because I want you to understand Timothy and the name of Timothy and, and its uh, meaning of the name. Uh, sometimes names don't have much meaning, but uh, Timothy means one who honors God. Now, we've got a couple of Timothys in our congregation. One who honors God. I hope you're living up to your name, Timothy, because that's really what it's all about sometimes. The, the word Paul, what does that mean? Paul means little or small. I, I, his original name, if you read Scripture in Acts chapter 8, is his name was Saul. They changed it to Paul. And uh, he must have been a small man. And they said, I, I like small, so that's where it is. And uh, so uh, he's, a, he's a small man. He's not tall like Winston or Peter or Randy Winuk. Uh, you know, they're, they're, he's a small guy, probably like me, you know. It says about the Apostle Paul, as he writes in 2 Corinthians 10.10, that his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. That's what the people of Corinth and other places talked about Paul. So here's the spiritual giant. His name is Paul. And <laughs> this is how some people perceived him as being unimpressive and contemptible in speech. And you go from place to place and you minister and people say, you know, don't listen to this dude. He doesn't know how to speak well. And uh, so, you know, this is what he had up against him as he walks through it. This morning we're going to be talking about Paul. And I've sort of mapped out uh, a little bit of history and, and where he was. I, I've got the purple one, which tells you where Ephesus is. And that's the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see that it's a little small little dot, really, on that map. Uh, you'll see way up in the upper left-hand corner in that orange slot is where Rome is. That's where he is presently. And then, of course, Paul's journey to Rome, that o yellow one is that <coughs> little island of Malta. He spends some time there after the ship is wrecked into the sandbar, if you remember that. And he had to spend some time there until spring. And then, of course, continue on with his journey to uh, Rome, where he was in prison at this particular time. 
the Apostle Paul is in prison. He is in Rome as he writes this letter of 1 Timothy. He's about 60 years of age, maybe 60, maybe 55. We don't know exactly about that. He is writing approximately in AD 62. Uh, we find that Paul writes seven letters from prison, and I uh, could probably enumerate them. Oh, back it up one more time. There we go. Oh, that's not what I want. There we go. Uh, we're going to be in Timothy, 1 Timothy, until February of 2019. So expect the journey here that we will have as we walk through it. You know, one of the boring things that I used to always sit in your place in the congregation or in a Bible class was going through all of the stuff that they give to you and dump on you about the history and the background of the book. You've got it all in just a five-minute period here. So here we go, okay? Uh, this morning's focus, we're going to get right into the text of the passage. We're going to go through verses 1 through 4 this morning. And uh, we're going to become, I hope, excited about what we learn. We're going to look at two goals for a pastor and the Christians in a local church. And this is what I think the Apostle Paul is wanting to start out. Let's read the first four verses in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our Lord. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless, endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. That's as far as we're going to go this morning. And our first important goal that I believe that the Apostle Paul is speaking about here in this particular passage is to have a confident hope. God wants you to have a confident hope in your life. There are some of you out there sitting this morning and you don't have that confident expectation and hope of tomorrow or the future, or of eternity. And I want you to really think about that this morning as we look at this first particular uh, desire and goal by God for him. It says, Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus. An apostle is simply a messenger, one sent out. Paul has been sent out, as it says here, by the command of God. Command. Yes, sir. No, sir. Right away, sir. Sounds like Army or Navy or Air Force or something. It's really a, a child. Child responding to the will of God. A child that is going to do exactly what God says in their lives. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not here because I wanted to become a missionary. I'm not doing this because I like doing what I'm doing. It's fun to spend overnight in the sea for three days. It's fun getting my back slashed with a whip. It's fun being confronted with people with stones in their hands wanting to kill me. I'm here to tell you that there were some severe times in the Apostle Paul's life as a missionary, and let me tell you, he was really, really struggling for his own life. He went through times of hunger. I, I think about the journey that he took to go to many of these places. You know, you think about it, that we, we travel today in such convenient ways. Air-conditioned vehicles. We get to spend overnight in a motel room. The Apostle Paul spent it in the mountains, no cover. He, he, he spent those nights in cold, miserable places, sometimes without food in his stomach. Get up the next morning, continuing to push on so he could get to the next town to get his breakfast or noon meal. I mean, there, there are things that the Apostle Paul went through. He was an apostle, a messenger of God, by the command of God. And he did it because God said, I want you to be who you are and where you are in life. Are you 
willing to be obedient to God's command for your life? Are you where you want to be, should be in your life? It doesn't really matter if you're a laborer, a housewife. It doesn't matter if you're working full-time, part-time, or no time. The issue is, are you where God wants you right now? I want you to understand, God has a purpose, and God has meaning for you in your life. And he wants to use you in your life. And he wants to honor you in your life. And, and when he commands us, it's because it's for our very best in our lives. You know, you look at that five-page list that I gave to you about the pastor's duties. You know what? If I was a high school teacher still, if I was still teaching high school, I'd get the whole summer off. I'd get a three-month vacation, sort of. And... Uh, I chose because God's command says, I want you to be a preacher boy. I want you to be a pastor. I want you to be a shepherd. It's a command of God, what he wants for our lives. But notice what it says. By the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is a command of God, but the, he has this word hope here. Our hope. What is your hope? The word hope in the Greek is not, I hope it rains tomorrow, or I hope it's sunny tomorrow. I hope it's nice so when I go to the beach that I can go swimming, or I hope, I hope, I hope. We hope about a lot of things in life. And some of those things are not going to come to pass because we hope it. The word hope in the Bible is something that is a future expectation that will be sure to happen. I've used this illustration over and over again. I'll give it to you one more time. I know when the sun goes down tonight, I'm going to hope for a new day tomorrow. And the sun will come up from the east side, and it will come up from the east and go up into the sky and do its very thing that it does every day. I know it's going to happen. Even if it's the most cloudy day, even if it's the most stormy day, you don't have those kinds of days here as much in Wisconsin, but in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, we used to have snowstorms that the snow would come for days upon days. The wind would blow the snow and blow the snow and blow the snow. We could not see the sun. We couldn't see any vision of the sun. It was like we were in a little bubble of darkness. But you know what? I knew it was day. I, I knew it was the next day. And I knew that there would be a day when it would stop and there would be a day that God would give us sunshine again. You see, the hope and expectation that we have in life, what is that hope and expectation that you have in your life as you read and study the word of God? And it may be the resurrection. It may be eternal life. It may be that you are going to see the face of Jesus Christ face to face. You see, these are the things that God has given to us in the word that we might have hope in this life. There are three gifts from God in this passage in verse 2. He says, I'm writing to you, Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul calls Timothy his true child in the faith. He doesn't say that about a lot of people, but he does to Timothy. Timothy has become very special to him. And when I think about this, I cannot help but think about Pastor Randy. Now, I want you to know that this, this man is special to me in my life. Just because things have turned out the way they have doesn't mean that Pastor Randy does not mean a lot to me. I spent 28 years with him. I poured my time, my energy, my life into that man. And I love him and I've loved him 
and I will love him. You need to understand, no matter what happens to Timothy, Paul said he's my true child in the faith. I love him with all that is within me. I care about him. I want the very best for him. You need to understand that ministry as a pastor is getting to know people and loving them and caring for them. Do you realize that there have been probably a hundred people in the last 38 years, and maybe God knows a whole lot more, that have come through this church, and some of them have attended this church for, for years, and then decided to leave for some unknown reason, and it broke my heart to watch them walk away from Grace Bible Church. Sometimes they would give me a reason, sometimes they would not. In all four of my ministries, that's, that's been the case. You pour yourself into people, you love them, you care about them, you want the very best for them, and then they walk away. I remember down in Illinois, we had a, a man and his family that attended our church, and he became an elder in our church. And, and for whatever reasons, things got tough, things uh, happened in our church, and him and his family left the church. And it broke my heart to see that happen. And then about maybe five or eight years into the ministry at West Dallas here, I get this phone call. And he says, you know, Les, I'm sorry I left you hanging. I was wrong. I, I should have stayed. I should have supported you. I should have been there for you, but I wasn't. You know, th those kinds of people really mean a lot to me. And, and, you know, you think that, well, they come, they go, you know, that's so good. It's, it's, not a, it's not a business. You need to understand. People are people. People have feelings. People... You know, they hurt. If you left this church, you need to understand you would be missed. You would be missed. Why? Because we love you and we care about you. This is a church family at Grace Bible Church. I, I, I hope that many of you know many people within the church here and that you get to know more and more people as time goes on. Yeah. That God builds this family relationship because he calls us a family of God. A community of people that are living and loving and growing together in Christ Jesus. And Timothy was one of these men. And uh, this man had three gifts from God. And I want to talk about those three gifts just briefly, if I may. To Timothy, my true child, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace. The first one is grace, a free gift. I like free gifts. I like giving free gifts. God says grace. Some say it's a favorable attitude. I like that. A favorable attitude. We are saved because of the grace of God. It's because God has graced us and given to us a free gift that you and I will enjoy eternity in heaven forever. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, talk to myself or Pastor Alex. We'd like to talk to you about that. It's the most important decision you will ever make in your life. Mercy. Mercy is not talking about or thinking about. It's showing kindness. <coughs> uh, it, God talks about it as taking and having pity towards people. Because <laughs> sometimes we are the most pitiful things in the world. And if you look at the Old Testament of Israel, and their, the nation of Israel, you'll find out they need mercy all the time. They are disgustingly evil and wicked, self-centered. 
And boy, did they need the compassion of God. But it's because of the compassion of God towards us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and has given to us the privilege of knowing him personally. And then there's peace. Peace, tranquility. You know when we really like to have peace? Is when we go to bed. We were taking care of little Hannah last night. And early this morning at 2 o'clock, little Hannah started to cry. I mean, she wasn't just crying. She was, yeah, I mean, really. She's got the most high-pitched voice in the world. And uh, I was watching her uh, for a while myself and delight in that wonderful opportunity. And I was looking at her, looking at her eyes, and she was eating a banana or something. And I thought, boy, she just talked and talked and talked. I mean, she's going to be a speaker one day, or she's going to be a, a, a vocalist uh, musicianally. I, I, something's going to happen with that girl. And she, does, she just babbles along, and then I babble with her, and blah, 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 blah. And she understands me. I don't know what I said, but we have a good time. But last night, she broke tranquility because we have the Ali and Lori and family in, and my wife is sleeping in the same room with little Hannah, and of course my wife got woken up, and she was out in the kitchen, and I was out in the kitchen, but I got up before she started to howl, and uh, I don't know, it's probably about a 20 minute ordeal, but uh, there wasn't much tranquility in my wife's life at that time, and uh, we just had to wait for the, the, she's going through some teething issues, and some, you know, you know how that is. Tranquility. But I want you to notice the next word in the Bible. Grace, mercy, and peace of God. The word of means that God has ownership of all three of these gifts. It's a genitive in the Greek. doesn't mean much to you if you don't know your English language that well but a genitive preposition, which means that God has it, and he wants to give it to you, all three of them. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Grace, mercy, and peace all come from God. They're all ours available to us that we might have them. Are you rich in having all three of them? I like to tell a story about an English woman, I'm, I'm going to name her Mary. And Mary had two daughters. And the first daughter that she had, the younger, passed away. And the second daughter, of course, she was free to raise and to bring up. And, and she was going on a trip one day, and her daughter had grown up, had gone to America, and she was traveling from, from England to America in a ship probably bigger than that, I'm not sure. But she was traveling in a ship and a storm came up. And as she was uh, in that, uh, on that ship and they were all told to go to a central place, uh, all the people were freaking out, as they say. They were just screaming and they were just biggest. The, the captain was saying, you know, we're in really tough waters. We, we don't know if we're gonna make it to America or not. And this woman was just as peaceful and calm as could be. And some of the people came up there and says, how in the world can you be so calm? There's, there's a storm out here and we might all die. We're all going to go down with the ship. She says, well, I got a ticket. And the ticket said that I'm going to go see my daughter. And if the ship goes down, I'm going to go see my daughter in heaven. And if I make it all the way across the sea, I'm going to see my daughter in America. So I'm going to make it to my daughter either way. She had the peace. Do you have that kind of peace in your life? You're, you and I are facing storms of life. And it's hope. It's that future expectation of knowing it's going to be okay. It doesn't matter to me if I die today or a hundred years from now. I know I have a hope of eternal life. I know where I'm going. 
If I die, I know that God is going to take my body that is dead and decayed and he's going to resurrect it and give me a brand new body. That's my hope, a future expectation to be sure because the word of God is true. I'm going to be able to see my loved ones that are saved and spend eternity with them. I'll, I'm going to tell you, I don't know too many of them from my past because I don't know too many of my relatives. And I'm looking forward with great confidence and expectation. Are you? Is that where you are in your Christian life? Or do you have some concerns? Do you have some problems with some issues? Talk to me about it. Be glad to talk to you. Second goal we're going to talk about this morning in this passage is to have a firm theology. How many of you, well, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you know what the word theology means? It, it sounds like a biblical issue. Yeah, it is. <laughs> theology basically means study of God. Ology means study of, and the word theos, which is a Greek word, means uh, God. So it's a study of God. So we all have theology. You don't, may not know your theology, your study of God, and what the question may be asked and what your answer may be, but that's okay. That's why we're here. We're here to grow in that whole process. But to have a firm theology, listen to what Paul tells Timothy in verses 3 and 4 in this passage. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. <coughs> you start to read this verse 3 it says I urge you the word urge is a command when I was going to Macedonia which is Corinth in that area remain at Ephesus I demand you to stay at Ephesus evidently Timothy was thinking about leaving Ephesus and the apostle Paul said don't leave I want you to stay there I want you to stay I got a I got a project for you Timothy What's the project? So that you may charge certain peoples not to, or persons not to teach any other different doctrine. How would you like a, a job like that? I'm sending you to a church, and there are certain people in that church that have a different doctrine, and I want you to go there, and you tell them, don't teach different doctrine. Hello? Meek, little me, want me to go to that church or stay at that church and, and to do that to confront these people? Mike, I don't want you to teach a different doctrine. No good, boy. <laughs> John, don't you teach a different doctrine. The issue is that there, there, are, there are a number of people within the church that were doing just that. They were teaching different doctrine. The word different is heteros, which means a different, a different kind of stuff. This is, this is what Paul left him there, or remained to be in that place at that particular time. Now I want you to go back with me to the book of Acts, but this time chapter 20. This is the church of Ephesus. The apostle Paul is on his last journey. He's on the last leg of his last journey to go back to Jerusalem. He is going to get arrested there. He's going to eventually end up in Rome where he is right now as he writes the book of 1 Timothy. So we're looking at this from the backside here before he gets there. If you look in verse 17 of chapter 20 of Acts, it says, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. The apostle Paul sends some messengers to go to Ephesus, come back to Miletus, and he wants to meet with the elders of the church. And the reason I think about this is probably because Paul's an old guy. <coughs> if he's about 57 years of age, I mean, this guy's been around the block a lot of times. 
And, and he probably needs the, the uh, young elders to come over to him and instead of him having to make a tramp a trip up to uh, Ephesus and then, of course, come back. Not only that, he's probably on a time frame that he has not need to catch his next ship, so they send some mes messengers to get up there quickly, maybe on a horse, to bring them back, and then, of course, to be able to meet with these guys. But as you look at this particular issue here, you will find that uh, there is a warning that the Apostle Paul gives the Ephesian elders. Okay, We're going to start here with verse 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now he's speaking metaphorically, okay? He's not speaking literally. There are not going to be fierce wolves coming into the church, okay? So these are, these are evil people. He says, I know that after I leave, there are going to be men that are going to come in among you, and they're not going to spare the flock. They don't really care about the people. Verse 30, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw the disciples after them. It is not people that come in from the outside and are trying to influence the people that are on the inside. There are people on the inside that are going to change their theology and they're going to try to get disciples after them and they're going to try to make people who believe differently than what they believe and as a result they're going to try to get them to pull away from truth. Think about that. That's pretty heavy. Notice what he says. From among your own selves will men arise. And they will speak twisted things and to draw disciples after them. Verse 31 says, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish everyone with tears. That was three years in Ephesus, Paul says, and I've been working with you folks. And he says, and I love you and I care about you. And now it's your job to protect the flock at Ephesus. The apostle Paul tells Timothy, he wants him to remain at Ephesus because there are some people in that church that do not believe what Paul has been teaching. Certain men, and you'll see that there very clearly. Now, you're, you're talking to a timid man, a timid man, okay? In chapter 2, verse 14 it, it, of 2 Timothy, he talks about Paul and Timothy, and Timothy be, is being timid as he is, shy, laid back, hard to confront people. But, but he gave him that task, and he says, I want you to charge, I'm giving you this charge, this command, that I want you to do this because somebody has to do it. If you don't do it, things are going to be in bad shape at Ephesus. If you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 again, Notice what he says here. I want you to charge them not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations. So the challenges that he has there and have been warning the Ephesian elders is the whole issue. And the character of the apostle of Timothy is that he's a shy guy. And here he is. He's timid. He's inadequate. He feels inadequate. He says, you know, he has to be told by the Apostle Paul that he is one that is to take and not despise his youth. Don't look down on the youth of yourself. Just because, because you think you're young, Timothy, he says, I want you to charge fully ahead. It's exactly what we've done with Pastor Alex here. He's a young whippersnapper, 23 years old, good-looking, sharp, He's ready to go. You don't look down on him now, okay? That's what God says. He's supposed to be Paul's example in chapter 1, verse 20 of, of chapter uh, 1 Timothy here. And he has even told that to Titus in Titus 1, 11. Speculations. Speculations. The word in the Greek means to be empty meaningless, idle disputes. We speculate things, right? 
That's what we call when we invest in the stock market. We speculate. We hope that the stock that we chose to put our money in, that we're going to make us more money. Sometimes the speculations go the other way. Stewardship from God. Stewardship from God, mentioned in that passage of Scripture in verse 4, says, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. A lot of people would look at this and say, well, it's dispensational stuff. No, it's not. It's, it's the plan of God. It's the purpose of God that he has intended for the church, the body of Christ. It may include dispensational teachings. It may include those things which are essential when we come to theology, some of you just get bored thinking about the word. Other views get excited about it. You say, man, I really want to do, you want to dig into it. That's me. Okay. I love doing that. But I understand. If you're bored, it's probably because you, you find it difficult to understand those concepts and ideas and thoughts. But understand, this is, this is the whole thing that is facing uh, Timothy. You've got different doctrine. You've got myths, you've got genealogies, and you can uh, go into the history of all of that and, and, you know, work through that thing. I want you to note this. I believe that the false teachers were elders in Ephesus. And the reason for that are, are given, four of them, okay? It is presumed that as you read verse 7 of this particular passage, it says, desiring to be teachers of the law. One of the reasons for elders is he's supposed to be able to teach. It may not be a group like this, but it may be one-on-one. -on -one. It may be a small group, but it's able to teach someone else the word of God, the truths of God's word. Elder is told to do that. Also, if you look at verses, verse 20, rather, at the end of the chapter, it says here, among whom were Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they should learn not to blaspheme. Evidently, these two guys were elders and leaders in the church at Ephesus, and he says, I've already kicked them out. I've already taken them off the law, and he says, I've taken care of them. You know, it's not fun having to take an elder and say you're no longer an elder. We've done that in a number of our churches as I've pastored over the years, and it's not, it's not easy stuff. It's not enjoyable stuff. Another reason is because in this particular book, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, he gives the qualifications of an elder. He also does that in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. But here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, he gives the qualifications of an elder, and we'll be looking at that down the road. And then in chapter 5, verses 19 through 22, he talks about sinning elders and how that you need to be taking care of those and publicly disciplining them. And that's not an easy job as well. I believe there are four of these four reasons why these false teachers were elders. And, should, and, and that even makes it more difficult for Timothy to go into that church and have to confront them and have to take and deal with them. The myths and the endless genealogies in and of themselves talk about the doctrine of demons in chapter 4, verse 1. We're not going to take any time looking at these. Worldly fables fit only for old women. Now, the Bible says that, so don't blame me, okay? <laughs> verse 7 of, of chapter 4, and we'll get to that one one of these days. Oh, better, here we go, two of them again. There we go. Oh, we'll get right. Okay, one more. Elements of Judaism. Basically, he's talking about the law. That is, he was talking about legalism, talking about the issue that you need to be saved by doing good works, keeping the Old Testament law, keeping the Ten Commandments, things of that sort, which, of course, we know are not true. There was a little church in Lake George, Michigan, that my wife and I went and attended and I spoke at. I was, I was in the process of looking for a church that I felt God would want me to go. And this particular church that we were, I was candidating for as a pastor, uh, we went there probably about three, four times. 
And we went to this little country church and we talked to the people, we got to know the people, and we found out that there were a number of things that were unscriptural about how they were doing business in the church. And I thought, well, <laughs> you know, I talked to the chairman of the board, which was a woman, not a man, and uh, in talking with her, I shared some of my ideas and opinions about the scriptures. And I came back again, and they asked me back again, and they finally had me for the final time. And uh, we, after the evening service, they were going to have a vote. But before they had their vote, they had a Q&A time. And so they gave me an opportunity to stand up there and to express my heart and desire and everything else, and, and I did. I says, here are some things you have wrong in your constitution and bylaws. Boom, 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 boom. If you want me as pastor, you're going to have to change all of these. And I said, these are some of the things you've been doing in this church and that are wrong. And I said, you need to change this, 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 and this. And I said, uh, you know, I, I laid it out on the line. I just laid it on the table. And so my wife and I, we went to the car, sat down and waited for the vote. And finally, some person came out and running out and said, oh, we voted 100% to have you as pastor. <laughs> I looked at my wife and said, huh? Well, how did this happen? Well, we didn't take the church, obviously. Because in reality, to go into that church and to change the Constitution and bylaws, to change the doctrinal statement, to change anything that was going on in church, you have to be there eight years, okay? Eight years. That's what they say, the average. Do you know how long it took for us to go from orange carpeting, <laughs> orange pews, and to the present chairs that you have at Grace Bible Church? Do you remember? I do. <laughs> 23 years. You know, we have to be very patient. These are things that are really not important. Color of pews and carpeting. What is important to God is theology. He's concerned about doctrine. We need to be solid in our theology. And in order for you as a Christian sitting in the pew, in the chair, in the chair, you need to be studying God's please, encourage you to study. I'm not asking you to get up to the level of pastor less, okay? Not asking that. But I want you to get up to Pastor Alex, okay? <laughs> <laughs> He'll do well, you'll see. In fact, this, this dude is, is, is really on top of it, and we're going to have a lot of fun Q&A time. And we're going to have a lot of fun discussing many issues theologically. But uh, Pastor Alex is way up there. I want you to know what you believe biblically. You may tell me what you, th if I ask you a question, you say, well, this, I believe this. I said, good, support it in Scripture. I, I want you to know well, what passage of Scripture will you tell me and show me from the Bible of what you believe to be true? I will listen, honestly. I'll listen to your words and thoughts and ideas, biblically. Oh, there I go, pushing the wrong button again. Scott, can you get me online here? <laughs> uh, I have to do this all the time. Uh, I don't know. I lost myself. Well, let, me, let me go back to my notes. Uh, that was my notes. <laughs> the last phrase that I wanted to bring up is stand fast. In God's word faithfully. That means that when, when we get to understand a truth and biblical doctrine and, and theology, let's stand on it. Hang in there. Believe it. You know, we're here to sharpen each other's iron. We're here to, to take and, and to grow in understanding of truth. My last statements. Oh, thank you. Will you boot me up again? Thank you. I'm on the last slide, so if you want to just turn me there. What is the shepherd's job in a church? That's me. <coughs> Encouraging the attenders. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. I hope that 
as you continue to come, as you continue to get into the word, that I will encourage you about your hope of eternal life, the resurrection, and other matters that God has given in his word. Secondly, that you will proclaim doctrine, that's me, that I will proclaim doctrine, correct doctrine, and instruction of God's word. That's why I study hard and diligently in order for me to know this word, in order for me to teach it. Not, not my desire to, to bring you and lead you astray, but to lead you in the correct direction that God would have you to be. You pray for me as I study. You pray for me as I work through the word of God that I might be able to do that which is pleasing in his sight for his honor and his glory. And do that for Pastor Alex as well. And then teaching the proper plan of God of faith. That's really what he wants us to do, to teach truth, to teach reality of what God has given to us in this book called the Bible. We call ourselves Grace Bible Church. It has given us the privilege of being able to be biblically based solidly on the Bible as being God's word. And our faith and our trust and our hope is all in that word. And I hope that you will take that with you. If you're here this morning and you're not in the word of God on a daily basis, I'm just going to encourage you to do so. And what's our memory verse for the month of July? Are you, do you even know the reference yet? How about the month of June? Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, okay? Hope you're memorizing that. It's good to hide God's word in your heart that you may not sin against God. A powerful truth to all of us. Well, this morning, let's bow in prayer. The worship team is going to come up. I'm going to